following program on Ave Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. Tonight, we discuss the new anti-corruption bill. Following contentious debates on the legal proficiency of this piece of legislature, proceedings are underway to better gauge the scale of action required when combating corruption. How crucial of a role does the new act play in furthering of justice? And what key pitfalls are addressed by the legislature? Very good evening and thank you for joining us on yet another episode of Law, Land and Liberty where we bring to you key items in the legal field and we're breaking it down for the label. Now today's topic is a topic that we have already touched on just a few weeks back with the same individual, the same distinguished individual, but we thought it was better to give uh, our viewers a bigger, a better analysis on this specific area which is the anti-corruption bill. Now this bill has been in contention for the past few months, actually it has been in the making for the past few years. Uh, and we're finally seeing it come somewhat into fruition. So uh, to speak about this, we have someone that is probably the most suited individual to speak about uh, anything related to corruption because um, of his experience and his expertise in this field, and that is Mr. Sarat Jaimana, President's Counsel and former Director General of the Commission to Investigate Corruption and Bribery. Thank you very much, sir, for taking the time to speak to our audience once again. Uh, this is your second time on our show, of course, and this time we're going to be speaking very specifically about the anti-corruption bill. Uh, so we're looking forward to a very insightful discussion. Uh, Mr. Sajjanamana is also the former senior additional solicitor general as well. So we can have a very key discussion about the creation. And of course, uh, uh, sir, you were very much involved in the entire making of this as well. Um, so before we get into the discussion, uh, here is a little bit of a breakdown on exactly how we're going to approach this topic. So first we'll be talking about the salient features of the anti-corruption bill that's being in proposition today and has been put into parliament. And next we'll be talking about the practical hurdles that are there to the prevention of corruption and how it is being addressed within the bill and what efforts have been taken. Finally, we'll be talking about the Offences and Penalties Act. What are the repercussions for corruption? My name is Vinoja De Silva. I'm an international relations student. My question is on the new anti-corruption bill. What are the features of the new bill and how does it differ from the existing regulations? All right, let's get right into the discussion. So thank you very much once again for taking the time. There's a lot for us to get right into. But before we get into any of that, so I think uh, being who you are, you have had a key role to play in the inception and the furthering uh, of this bill. Even when it is brought into parliament, uh, you've played a key role in how the bill has come about. So could you please just walk us through how drastically you were involved in the inception and the creation of this bill, sir? Uh, thank you very much, Anuradhi, for inviting. Again, uh, maybe listeners are keenly watching uh, the key aspects of the Anti-Corruption Act. Uh, you know, I was the Director General for the Bribery Commission for nearly three years. That was the time we really felt that we were lagging behind because we were a party to the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, that is called UNCAC. We became a party in the year 2004. Our uh, last anti-corruption law we introduced in the year 1994. And the Bribery Act was introduced in the year 1954. The Asset Declaration laws were introduced in 1975 and 85. So you can imagine how we were lagging behind. Of course, anti-corruption laws are always updated. That is why the world community, they got together and prepared this particular convention. Immediately, Sri Lanka became a party. However, UNODC, that is the arm of the UN, that basically monitors how the countries have been doing this. And they have visited Sri Lanka and uh, we have visited Vienna and other UN officers and they were 
looking and examining our laws. And they have found there are certain gaps in our law. There were two review cycles conducted by the UNODC. And uh, they, are, they are asking the question always, why you are not updating your law? In the meantime, they found we never even had a national action plan to eradicate bribery and corruption. So then we thought to ourselves, maybe we don't have or we didn't have necessary expertise in Sri Lanka. We will learn from other countries who have been successful and similarly who have not been successful. And we learned a lesson and we learned the subject and started drafting. Because I must say, a law cannot be drafted overnight. The legal draftman department persons, they may have the skill of drafting, but they may not, the sub, they may not know the subject. Without knowing the subject, this cannot be drafted. So therefore, we have had very close collaborations with countries like Bhutan, Hong Kong, uh, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, and other international agencies as well. So then we started drafting this law. Then the then government was very keen in drafting this law. By the end of 2019, uh, with the help of the uh, some of the legal officers in the Bribery Commission, that, that is CABOC, and with the legal draftman department officers, we basically drafted this law in the year 2019. Thereafter, what happened? I left the Bribery Commission, uh, nothing has happened. Then this new government came into power. Then Honorable Minister of Justice, Dr. Vijaydas Rajapaksa, he appointed a committee in which he made me as the chairman. And we, we have had several rounds of uh, stakeholder discussion. And we, then we fine-tuned the document that we have already drafted. And that is how my involvement in this drafting stage. Then it went before the parliament. Before the second reading, there were several challenges. And most of the challenges came from not from outsiders. There were a few one or two outsiders. Strangely, this bill was challenged by some of the legal officers in the SEBOC. We cannot even imagine how, when a new law is being brought, how the legal officers can challenge that particular decision. Then, Anurad, you will understand, uh, people does not like a change. Whenever you want to make a change in any country, uh, they will always resist the change. Why we always think the way we have been doing for the last couple of decades must be good. That is the best way. So that is how my involvement in the draft stage. And then the Supreme Court uh, basically uh, made certain recommendations at the committee stage to be made. So even the AG has also recommended certain committee stage amendments. Now those amendments have come. And uh, the parliament debated second reading uh, on the last day. Thereafter, the se several members of parliament also made recommendations. And thereafter, there was a committee stage discussion last week. Uh, so most of the concerns of the members of parliament were addressed. I think the government uh, very soon, uh, maybe in the first week of July, uh, this uh, bill would be taken up for third stage debate and for the vote. So that is where we are now. Right now we're at a very promising stage. It's about to break uh, and it might very well uh, be enacted and it could change our legal sphere probably for the better for the coming years. Yes, sir. Now, sir, you mentioned that 2019 was a crucial year, but I, am a, I was made aware that in 2018, uh, there was uh, the specific uh, uh, focus on the UN uh, Convention of Independence and Efficiency of anti-corruption agencies. Now, this Colombo commentary where 30 experts had uh, visited Sri Lanka and did uh, their review of exactly how these systems work, was there a drastic implication or was there like an effect that was uh, had on the drafting of this bill on that end, sir? Certainly. Uh, this is how it happened. Uh, in uh, United Nations Convention Against Corruptions, there are two provisions dealing with the independence and the efficiency 
of the anti-corruption agencies world over. Then that was the time that we were making uh, a progress in our work. Then UN requested whether they could visit Sri Lanka with, uh, with, at their expense with 30 experts. So they came here for nearly three days and they prepared a document that is a commentary. Commentary that would give a guidance to member states as to how they must implement this independence and the e efficiency of anti-corruption agencies. They prepared that document. Now that is labeled as Kalamb commentary on anti-corruption agencies. So therefore, UN has recognized the role played by the CBOC here in Sri Lanka and our officers, they helped us. So now it gives the guidance as to how uh, independence and the efficiency and that learning helped us a lot. So we incorporated those learning during which we learn uh, in the new bill. In the meantime, whenever we make reports or whenever we attend various workshops in Vienna, we used to have side meetings with other countries. Those are not necessarily mandated, but we have had side meetings with other countries and we have learned and we have incorporated note down their suggestions and with certain amendments that is suited to our country, uh, we have incorporated in this bill. Exactly. So there is a lot of work that went into the versatility yes. of the bill in its very early stages, yes. right up till uh, when it was tabled uh, at Parliament. Now, so I think it's good. Uh, it's a good segue for us to get right into the technical aspects of the bill. So, if you could now, in the previous uh, episode, we actually spoke a little bit in uh, an overview about how this bill uh, differs from key legislature. If you could just point us out, uh, sir, to key areas where the anti-corruption bill stands out from other legislature that was already in existence uh, in fighting corruption. If you could just uh, walk us through that, sir. Yes. Now, this anti-corruption bill uh, gives prominence to the appointment of independent commission. Independent commission uh, hierarchy, uh, it is the three commissioners. The law so far we have had enable only to appoint judges and senior police officers and instigators as commissioners. Anyhow, the government has taken a policy decision. Here and after, no retired officers will be appointed. Because through, through past history, probably they have learned a lesson. So they thought the age of the commissioners, by the time they are appointed, should be below 62 years. Unlike for the last three decades, the government, after learning from other countries, they have taken decision to appoint commissioners from various fields. One commissioner is from the field of law. Then two other, two other commissioners can be from various other sectors, maybe forensic auditing, accounting, engineering, management, etc. If you look at the uh, world over, the commissioners have the highly technical expertise. Not only the expertise, they have to have leadership qualities. Because running a commission, not only taking a decision to prosecute, there are other aspects as well, especially when it comes to the prevention and education. You have to liaise with the other government and private sector department. So therefore, you have to have commissioners who know how to conduct complicated investigation into accounting. For example, it's a serious white collar crimes, right? The commissioners must be in a position to guide the investigators. That is number one. The other difficulty we have had is, in the past, we had to always go to the government departments for the survival of the anti-corruption commission. Nowhere in the world it happened. Of course, the funds belong to the government was going through this uh, traditional routine mechanism through the Treasury and the Finance Ministry, then the Public Service uh, Ministry, very cumbersome. So therefore, uh, whenever the Commission decides that they need a monetary facility, they must submit a proposal to the Parliament. Of course, with the, with the, with the knowledge of the Finance Minister, and Parliament will go through and approve this. Then the Treasury has to 
allocate this amount. This will go to a particular fund. This fund, of course, the commissioners do not have power to arbitrarily misuse. Uh, this, this can be audited by the auditor general. So that is one of the key instances that the commissioners would have funds. Otherwise, the treasury might think, what is the use of having a bribery commission? Why should we allocate these funds? That is, that is the other uh, key thing. Then these commissioners are appointed by the Constitutional Council. Of course, the recommendations are made by the Constitutional Council. It is the president who appoints. Unlike the last time, this time, even the director general has to be appointed by the Constitutional Council recommendation. Before nominating director general's nomination, president has to consult the commissioners. Then there has to be synergy between the commissioners and the DG. DG is a person uh, who has some knowledge and expertise in prosecution. Why? Director general is the person who signs the indictment. I was appointed director general not because I am a lawyer. I have had three decades of experience as a prosecutor. I have had experience as a supervising officer. Look at the draft prepared by my junior officers in the attendance department. So this management and the skill of the drafting is very essential. That is why we have put in, in this time, uh, the DG must be a person who have experience in and the knowledge about the prosecution, especially to supervise the draft made by the junior officers. Then the draft, then the joint of charges, any legal issue that might crop up in court, Legal officers always go to the director general. Director. He must be expert in law. There's no question about that. He cannot be from other fields. He has to be from the field of law. So then the DG, how can the DG be removed? He cannot be easily removed. He also needs some qualification. He, there are certain disqualifications to become the DG. Similarly, commissioners also must have a certain qualification. They also have a disqualification. So I'd like to interject there and ask you, uh, sir, now when it comes to being recruited into the commission and being part of the commission, how exactly now we have learned of what new powers have been granted in order to expedite the process of targeting corruption. But how exactly does this bill hold commissioners accountable, mm. the, uh, the members of the commission? How is that? Uh, Very good question. That is why if you look at the social media, some may speak positive about the anti-corruption bill, some may be very critical. But you have to understand this. UNCAC came into existence from 2004. How many governments were there? How many persons were there in the government learned in law? Did they take any attempt to prepare a draft bill to this level? Did they bring down experts from other countries and in liaison with our practical experience, did they take anything? Nothing. So when you prepare a document of this nature, you can find out minor loopholes, definitely. We, we accept those loopholes with a good heart, definitely. But uh, if you make any criticism without any malice, we are more than happy to accept. We have accepted certain things. And accordingly, we have amended certain things. But we have to understand, for the first time after 1994, 30 years after, this act is coming. And Sri Lanka lacks expertise. Sri Lanka is a country where even in law faculties, law colleges, and judges institute, it is not a subject bribery and corruption. So we want to develop the law without any, any subject is incorporated in this curriculum. So you ask a valid question. The, the commissioners and the director general have been given enormous amount of power. Power is needed. When you give power, you have to be extremely cautious. Why? There can be a commission, yeah, there can be some commissioners who are revengeful, who want to take some action against their own officers who wants to go against some political figures in the opposition. We have to be mindful. Power is needed, but there has to be checks and balances. So what we have done here, here is, and the efficiency also. Now, if they are not efficient, 
if they are not delivering the goods, who is there? On the other hand, can we appoint another formal body over them to supervise? Then, then what happened? Independence of the commission will suffer. So these are the difficult challenges. You know, Plato once said, laws are not necessary for a country if the people in the country, uh, they, they are, their value is morally high. Laws are needed, strict laws are needed, because pe the people don't have their integrity. If we are in our integrity is sufficient enough, we don't have strict laws. But what to do? We don't, our integrity is not that high. For every minute thing, we have to introduce laws. Some countries are there, their laws are simple, and everyone abides by that. But here is a country, we are very litigious. If there is something missing, some minute thing, what will happen? They will start criticizing and that will be challenged. Now, what are the checks and balances? The moment the commissioners come into the picture, before they are appointed, they have to give a declaration of their interest, what site, what sort of person he is, with whom he has connection, business-wise, otherwise. In private sector, he must show, I am a fit person, that I don't have any, any other linkage, business deal, professional links with other, other entities. You have to sever all those connections and come to the commission. That is number one. Then you have to give asset declaration. Then we have incorporated the provision, even there ethically, there has to be a code of ethics. And they have to prepare this code of ethics, they have to comply with those code of ethics. So these are the novel provisions they have introduced. Then they have to give the asset declaration as usual. Now earlier, the commissioners in the commissioners, they were not liable for asset declaration. But this time, commissioners in every commission have been responsible to declare asset declaration. That is at the inception. Then, if the commissioners cannot do anything without being an oversight. So they, here, there has to be a quarterly report submitted to the parliament about their what? About their performance. Parliament may not be able to question the individual investigation, but if there's a general lacuna, general lethargy, lethargy, inefficiency, of course parliament can question. That is how in other countries, uh, they have very vibrant uh, anti-corruption commissions. There is a lot of accountability. Accountability, yes. accountability has to be there. Not only that, I will explain, sir, furthermore, you have asked a very valid question, which the people of this country might want to know. Then uh, annually, also they have to give a report, maybe financial things. Then, then they can make a request if they are unable to cope with the work and if they need more resources, they must, they must inform the parliament. We never had such mechanism up to now. They are just writing letters to the treasury. It will end up with the assistant secretary for treasury. You know, they treat like bribery commission as like any other department in the government. No, you can't do like that because treasury people, they are public officials, they also come under the purview of the bribery act. So I don't know that they are very keen to develop the anti-corruption mechanism. You know, in the meantime, international agencies, European Union, uh, IMF, they are also asking questions. The, this time also they have asked questions. Not because they have asked questions, the government has introduced this thing. Of course, they are also keen. Because they ask the question, show us the goodwill of the people and the government of this Sri Lanka. So they are asking, where is this anti-corruption law? Well before IMF came to the picture, we have drafted this. Well before the IMF came to this picture, of course, we have modified now, we have fine-tuned. But we can't say just because IMF that we started drafting, it is not the case. Then other mechanism is, uh, they have to give annual report. Then, if you conduct investigation on a complaint, the progress of the investigation without having any disturbance on the investigation, you have to inform to the complainant at his request. So therefore, we never had such thing. We never had such thing, number one. Number two, after conducting investigation, if the commission decides not to proceed, not to file a case, in the file, the commission has to lay down the reason as to why they have decided not to prosecute. It's a novel thing. 
Now statutorily these are laid down. One can say if they are, these are not complied, these decisions can be challenged in a higher, up, higher up form in the judiciary. Right? So then not, not only that, you have to inform the complainant. Why you have taken a decision not to, not to do this? That is number two. And the third one is a very serious one. There have been accusation, rightly or wrongly, the bribery commission was in the habit of withdrawing cases. Now what we have done is, withdrawal is necessary, but now we have laid down certain criteria and conditions. For example... So if there is a withdrawal, you need to specifically state exactly why, why? there is some form of... Definitely, maybe uh, uh, withdrawal may be due to uh, the witnesses may not be available, documents may not be available. So what is the purpose of proceeding with the case? What is the purpose of the proceeding in the case? That is one example. Then what is the, because we are taking valuable court time. We actually have to get into the uh, Director General's role as well, how crucial of an impact that the Director General's role has on the entire commission because uh, that is undeniably a lot of power that is now being handed. Uh, but just as you mentioned, sir, there is a lot of accountability all around to the claimant, uh, through the victim. Uh, there is a lot of checks and balances and it cannot be argued that it is a baseless, uh, it, it's almost a baseless accusation about exactly how uh, uh, free uh, any sort of commission member yes. is. Uh, but before uh, we get into any of the practical hurdles, let's take a very short commercial break. You're watching Law, Land and Liberty. Stay with us. Welcome back to Law, Land and Liberty. We were in conversation with Mrs. Saj Jaimani, President's Counsel and former Director General of the Commission to Investigate Bribery and Corruption. Now, we just had a very insightful first segment regarding how the Commission members can be held accountable. Uh, and we just left off right before we were able to get into the specifics of the role of the Director General of this entire Commission. So, sir, if you could start us off with this first uh, second segment uh, by explaining to us in detail exactly what uh, role does, the, how crucial of a role does the Director General play in this commission and how the Director General is also held accountable? A little bit of an explanation from the previous uh, segments. Yes. Uh, Director General is the public face of the Anti-Corruption Commission. He is the CEO. He is in charge of the accounting. He is the Chief Executive Officer. So in every sense, it is the Director General who runs the Commission. Major decisions are taken by the Commissioners, but those decisions are implemented by the Director General. Every indictment, every charge in the Magistrate Court, those are signed by the Director General. Then all the guidance to the legal officers and the investigators are given by the Director General. The conduct of the prosecution, withdrawal of the cases, done by him. Not only that, this time we have incorporated very important section. We have been using this punitive section for the last 30, 40 years now. But UNCAC requires that you have to have a prevention mechanism. That means now the commission is charged with the responsibility of prevention. What do you mean by prevention? Prevention means that they are required to look at the procedures and gui guidelines of each and every government department. And if there are loopholes that are vulnerable, susceptible for bribery and corruption, and there are breeding grounds for bribery and corruption, they must interfere and tell these government departments to rectify those procedures. So Director General is the key. He has a lot of you know, enormous amount of power. So then now the question arises, first of all, when the new commission is appointed, 
they must have certain regulations prepared, certain guidelines prepared. What are the regulation guidelines? Internally, you would have a disciplinary procedures. Now, with this commission, what, will, what is the most important thing so far we have not discussed is that we are going to get quality, quality investigators. That means we need the people who have the masters, expertise, real expertise in investigators. Now, up to now, with all due respect, who are the investigators we had? We had some police officers borrowed from the police department. They may be good in conducting raid in bribery cases, but we need some experts who have the accountancy background, forensic auditing and forensic accounting background. We never had. Now, what have we done here? In the new act, Commission need not seek the support of the Public Service Commission. Commission need not go through the minutes of the, the recruitment in the public service. That is what we have been doing. During my period, I want to recruit 100, uh, 200 investigators, graduates. We never had graduates. Then we wanted to create a new cadre. You know, in the government department, to create a cadre, you have to go, go before the public service, management service, treasury, salaries and cadre commission, what not. So many obstacles. Even if they give their consent to prepare a new cadre, they will put down in the law or in the public service. And they, it is not attractive. In other countries, what they do? You can have their own recruitment mechanism. So then what happened? The, they have to come out with recru recruitment processes, the rules. Then they have the disciplinary control. And if, the, if their performance are good, what can you do? They have to be more encouraged by way of allowance and other things. So that power has been vested with the commission. That is how commission in Fiji, Bhutan, Malaysia do. Even in Fiji, the salary of the prosecutor is very much higher than the salary of a prosecutor in the Attorney General's department. Why? They are subject specific, really talented. So now that discretion has been given to this particular commission. So now they must come out with this recruitment process. They have to prepare. For example, forensic accounting, forensic auditing. The bribery commission does not have power. Now we have an incorporated section that says, the bribery commission, do I say bribery commission, you have to think that it is a say book, right? For convenience, I use the word bribery commission. The bribery commission can look around and if there's a good investigator, good accountant, we need forensic auditors, not near auditors, forensic auditors. And in other countries, these investigations are done by the engineers. They, they have the maths background, no? especially when you conduct investigation into white collar crimes committed by senior public servants or politicians, you will have to be seriously intelligent. Merely passing certain exams will not bring your intelligence. So therefore, you have to be really intelligent, forensic accounting, forensic audit. Even this bribery commission does not have the facility of obtaining the support of the Auditor General. When we ask the Auditor, Auditor General at least to give us a support with regard to this particular investigation, they have the best expertise, no? Then they say, no, no, we can't give you support. Our duty is to submit reports to the Parliament. Now your question is, we have several questions have been raised. Now the Auditor General submits report to the Parliament. And can't be prosecuted on those reports. You have to understand. Main object of the Auditor General here is to find out whether there was a loss to the government. Any financial irregularity committed in the government sector. They are not looking for the exact person who is responsible. And it is the duty of the bribery commission to find out the exact person who has intentionally allowed someone else to gain public funds or someone because of his decision making process, public servant, that some, there was a someone, some, there was some loss to the any outsider. 
and we have to identify that particular person. So that is the difference between Auditor General and the Bribery Commission. Now what, what we have done here, we can seek, we can get the services of any person working in the government sector, including the Audit General's department. Of course, after informing the senior management of the Audit Commission, without this sacrifice, we can't make this country corruption-free country. For example, everyone wants the bribery commission to be successful. But my question is, Anuradhi, those professionals who speak high of anti-corruptions, would they come and support us? And this is an opportunity. They can come here on part-time basis. You don't, you don't need to work full-time. Here we have the part-time contracts, full-time contract, and if they are good, their contract can be extended. So therefore, I am inviting ladies and gentlemen in various profession, don't merely point the finger at the bribery commission. As Sri Lankans, we have a role to play. Come and support us, especially the lawyers. Lawyers are very critical sometimes too. And those lawyers, uh, they can contribute. Why not? If they, if they are considering certain loopholes in government departments, so these lawyers come and support us uh, in preparing these guidelines. If there's a lacuna in the law, we can recommend to the government. There's some lacuna in the law pertaining to the Motor Traffic Act. And that, 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 that breeds the corruption and bribery in the, in the customs department. So likewise, the lawyers who are very good in procurement businesses and uh, the involvement of major projects, the, the bribery commission may not have that, that expertise and they can voluntarily join, of course, they'll be paid. So that is why I say the director general is the key person. If, if the director general acts against the spirit of the bribery act, and if his activity is negative, what can you do? Of course, he can be removed. Of course, the president cannot remove, uh, take an arbitrary decision. He has to consult the bribery the commissioners, and it is the Constitutional Council who takes the decision to remove. What about the removal of the three commissioners? Again, like judges in the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal, they cannot be easily removed. You have to bring a resolution before the parliament and they have to be removed. So they are, likewise, we have various checks and balances. The enormous amount of power has been given. Checks and balances are there. So therefore, Director General is the key person in the new anti-corruption commission. Uh, sir, that was a very uh, insightful topic on exactly how the Director General plays the pivotal role when it comes to the functioning and the furthering of mm. the bribery uh, of Siabok. Uh, now, I want to ask, sir, we don't have much time. Before we go into a break, sir, just a question on the inclusivity of, of UNCAC, the UN Convention Against Corruption. Could you just, before we go into a break, sir, explain uh, to our viewers in brief was the entirety of UNCAC adopted into the bill or what was uh, uh, altered? What were the practicality aspects? Yes, if you look at the UNCAC, they have recognized certain offenses. For example, conflict of interest. What do you mean by conflict of interest? That if I am a public servant, if I am going to take a decision in respect of person whom, with whom I have connection, maybe relation, monetary wise, college mate, school mate, you, if you have a relationship, you have to inform your manager. And without informing, if you take a decision, what will happen? We have made it a criminal offence. So therefore, we have included this new offence. Uh, then we, bribery commission will get the power to conduct investigations into money laundering. Early we did have power. When the predicate offence is bribery and corruption, bribery commission will get the power into this one. Then we have the, we have new uh, the offense called uh, sexual bribery. Sexual bribery means uh, we have introduced sexual favor as one of the modes of gratification. So in colloquial terms, we say it is sexual bribery. And what, what do you mean by sexual favor? That means if you are indulged in having rape, grave sexual abuse, or if you use social media, electronic media, uh, to in, in respect of your body, and that has been included. 
So then in addition to that, we have included sports corruption, etc. Not only that, we have included new provision to protect the whistleblowers. And whistleblower is the person who works in a particular organization and he secretly gives information to the bribery commission. And thereafter, head of that particular organization takes a decision to transfer and the demote this public servant, whoever, what will happen? Uh, it has been made a criminal offense. In the meantime, we'll have to understand some people come and give false complaints, knowing very well that it's false and that offense was already there, we have reintroduced that offense. So that likewise, then the private sector bribery. People think only the government officers should be responsible. But if you take the, the rationale of the anti-corruption world over, private sector involvement is very pivotal. So therefore, we have taken certain private sector entities, that means higher level, like the listed companies, uh, insurance, the higher level companies, uh, those are there in the schedule, they are responsible, they are guilty uh, if they take a bribe. Maybe private sector must be taking a bribe from another private sector employee. Maybe private sector taking a bribe from another citizen. All have been incorporated as private sector bribery. And those are the new things that we have introduced. There are other offences as well. Exactly. And we should probably get into the offences and penalties aspect as well. But uh, before that, we've run out of time for this segment. Let's take a very short commercial break. You're watching Law and Liberty. Stay with us. My question is on penalties and offences. How does the NFL approach the correction of corruption? Welcome back to Law Land and Liberty. We were in discussion with President's Council, Sir Jaimana. Sir, before we went into the break, we were talking about the key role that the Director General played and the accountability aspect and also uh, UNCAC and the differences and what has been included in the new bill. Now, I think uh, it's a very important thing for us to understand um, how exactly does the bill function when it comes to penalties and offences? Now, I would like to ask you, sir, is there any sort of retrospective effect that the bill provides uh, in its current state? Uh, you have to un understand, Radhi, we have to uh, act according to a legal framework. Article 13.6 of the Constitution says, you cannot introduce any law, any substantive laws with retrospective effect. The only exception is if, if there is a particular offence that is recognised as uh, offences by the, the world community, community of nations, and then those can be introduced as respective offence. That is how in uh, famous say Paul Econichael's case, the offences committed against aircraft was introduced with the retrospective effect. Now I see in certain quarters they are asking, why we don't have this law retrospective effect on 2004? What I say is, if any offence has been committed after 2004, bribery or corruption, still those offences can be investigated into. Because, just because we introduce a new law, does not mean offences committed under the previous law, or investigated committed under the previous law, or cases pending under the previous law will not be prosecuted. No, those offences committed prior to this introduction of these laws, under these transitional provisions, you can, they can proceed with. Only thing is we can't introduce offences like uh, the conflict of interest <laughs> with retrospective efforts, uh, offences like private sector bribery. What will happen, people will start sending petition that happened, uh, some incident in 2005. We have to understand. EP, EP, even offences committed uh, within the last two, three years, people are delaying sending petitions. What is the credibility of the witnesses who send petitions after 10, 15 years? You have to understand the practical situation. Not only that, we presented the bill 
to the Supreme Court on the basis of prospective, prospective basis. No person came before the Supreme Court and asked, uh, the saying that the, the, these are offenses under the UNCAC, like uh, the basically the uh, conflict of interest. So therefore, this bill lacks its objective and it's a violation of Article 12 of the Constitution. Therefore, pressurize the government to introduce this uh, bill with retrospect. Right? No person came before the Supreme Court and challenged. Now, Supreme Court basically approved this bill on the basis it is prospective nature. That's Article 78, Subsection 3. It says, at the bill stage, if you present the bill to the Supreme Court uh, in a particular way, at the committee stage, you cannot introduce anything uh, that would cause any damage to the spirit of the act. So therefore, the, the exact, exact words, uh, that is word is merit and principles upon which the bill was presented to the Supreme Court cannot be violated. So, so therefore, we cannot introduce respective laws at this stage. Yes. So, sir, now we know that the retrospective aspect is a very complicated mm. procedure where uh, there really isn't uh, that much of a, a push towards mm. that as well. But I'm sure that uh, a lot of us would like to understand a very key feature uh, of the entire field of corruption and what uh, the bill is trying to bring about is the whole asset declaration issue. If you could walk us through how asset declaration is approached in the new bills, I think. You know, uh, as even we had a very archaic asset law, asset declaration law. Fine was only 1,000 rupees. Manually, you have to submit. And what a shame for a country and we claim that we have the highest intelligence in this country, still we don't have an uh, electronic asset declaration form. And we have gone, come a long way. We have had several, maybe seven, eight rounds of discussion with the World Bank and the Swiss government. They came here and we have had several discussions, we have learned from them and we have introduced very sophisticated, very highly advanced uh, electronic asset declaration system. And here in after public servants are required to submit the asset declaration online. What achievement? Uh, of course, uh, the ICTA, they have also helped us. So public servant has to submit asset declaration online. Then what happened next year, you have to edit the asset declaration if there are anything. Now in this asset declaration, not only, uh, not only the assets and liabilities, they have to declare. They have to declare their income and expenditure and other interests as well, they have to declare. Then uh, if, if you declare, if the, where do you send this asset declaration? Not anywhere. Why? You have to send this asset declaration to the special directorate of the newly set up anti-corruption commission. So therefore they will verify if there are doubts, computer will give a red flag if your assets are not compatible with the non-income. In the meantime, commission may have received complaints then they will conduct investigation. While conducting investigations, they won't send letters to the more traffic department and the customs to find out this particular person has any other assets. Why? They can link online to the, the data system of other government departments. So those things we have introduced. Then what will happen? Uh, we have incorporated uh, certain persons who should give asset declaration. President should give, provincial council members they should give, so local authority they should give, commissioners in commissions they should give, then, then the diplomats work in, uh, in Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan diplomats work in other countries they should give. So all those loopholes have now been plugged in. So therefore, now we have, they, there are more than 300,000 persons have to give declaration. People are asking, um, it should be increased, but can we cope? We have, to, we, have, we have to introduce a law that can, that can be managed by the private commission. Then uh, if you don't give the asset declaration, there won't be a prosecution for the first time. One month is given. During that one month is not given, there will be a surcharge. Uh, that is equivalent to your one month salary. Second month also, if you don't give, there will be a surcharge equivalent to six month salary. Third month only, they will start prosecuting. So likewise, we have introduced very novel methods. Then what happened? You will get an acknowledgement. When you give an online asset declaration, the recipient will get, get an acknowledgement. Head of, the, the head of the department will come to know this whether his employee, whether he has given the asset declaration or not. not. Then in the meantime, there are certain 
officer, they are not necessarily staff officers. They are in the middle rankers. Technically speaking, they are not required to give asset declaration. But the, uh, the commission, can, by way of a regulation, can identify those designations and ask them to give asset declaration. So likewise, we have developed very effective, very, very sophisticated asset declaration, and we need experts to work in this. Don't look at the bribery commission and say they are not delivering. Having a law is important, but not only having the law, we need to unite in implementing this bribery, our Anti-Corruption Act. Definitely, and I feel like that is the perfect uh, uh, note for us to end this discussion on. So there's a lot for us to speak about. Unfortunately, we have come against time once again, uh, just like a few episodes ago. Uh, but I'm sure that our viewers are going to walk away tonight with a lot of information on the new bill and some animosity that may have been present uh, in regards to the changes that are being proposed with this bill may have been dissolved with your explanation, of course. Uh, so thank you very much, sir, for taking the time. Thank you very much uh, uh, for... Uh, give me an opportunity because this explanation is needed because we don't have an opportunity to make, raise this voice in any other place. When you invite me like this, they can, I, I can explain uh, certain concerns uh, raised by certain interested parties. Thank you so much for giving me this valuable opportunity. It is my pleasure. All right. Well, corruption and bribery are offences that may seem to be out of our depth in tackling for an average citizen of Sri Lanka. However, it's important to realize that each and every one of us has the responsibility and now the legislative power to act upon these injustices. The role of the people is to uphold our standards of integrity, come what may. We leave you tonight with the words of Kishore Mahubabni, Singaporean diplomat and former president of the United Nations Security Council. Corruption is a cancer that steals from the poor, eats away at governance and moral fiber and destroys trust. That is all from us here at Law, Land and Liberty. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. I'm Anradi Vikramasinghe. Thank you for watching. Have a great night. <laughs>